Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. We're ready to get back on our Father's Word. Book of Daniel. My God is judge. And that's what you want to always remember, that being the, the translation of Daniel, the meaning thereof. Uh, our Father is judge. You're not supposed to judge people. He's capable. He doesn't need your help. You should learn to discern. But <clears throat> we come up to one of the mo most famous prophecies in God's Word. We concluded in the last lecture in chapter 9, verse 24, where uh, the angel Gabriel himself appeared, and he gave a um, declaration. So you don't want to try to change it because he didn't put it in parable form. He just told you how it was going to be. If you remember, he said, Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon the holy city, Jerusalem, of course, to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy, complete it, and to anoint the most holy. That means to put our Father on the throne, and there he sits forever. So 70 weeks are how long? Well, first of all, it's, it's 70 weeks of years, which is to say 490. And uh, 60, you're going to have to learn to break this down because there is a gap between the 69th and the 70th week. The 70th week is even future to where we are right now. And as you will learn as we get into the word here. But 69 weeks of years, when you figure the time period at the time the prophecy was given by Gabriel from Almighty God, and you come up to the time that Christ walked the earth. It is a prophecy that no one can deny. And it is amazing to me that some people would try to discredit the book of Daniel. Can you believe that? They do. Certain higher critics. Uh, but Christ himself referred to Daniel, as we're going to find out today. So with those 70 weeks of years being 490, let's get into it and see if we can, what we can ascertain from the prophecy by picking it up. Chapter 9, verse 25, a word of wisdom from our Father. Let's go with it. Verse 25 reads, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince, and I want you to note this word prince is in uppercase, shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. That's 69 weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublesome times. Now, those of you that have companion Bibles, I want you to make a note of Appendix 91. I'll say it again. Appendix 91. It will give you a breakdown on this, these particular weeks that's very interesting and it gives you a diagram that is very helpful if you have difficulty uh, picturing numbers in your mind. Verse 26, after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, uh, uh, but not of himself, he was crucified. Okay. And the people of the prince, notice this prince has a lower case. It is not the prince of princes. The prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with the flood, flood of lies, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. And it is those, uh, that is the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. We pick that up in the next verse. So here we have from the actual time that... Um, 
this, this event transpired where Daniel would have been about 87 years old at that time, and how precious it is that our father continues, and we have such a record that uh, gives us actual count how anyone could deny Christ was Messiah after understanding that would be hard put because it, it is an overlay of the book of Revelations, number one, the, the book of Daniel, and, and or vice versa. Actually, Daniel was first and Revelation overlays to give more detail. But when an angel directly gives a prophecy you don't want to mess with that too much. You don't want to try to start changing things because it is, it is said, and as Amen says, that's that. No more need be said. But what does this mean then that we have two different princes and naturally you've been taught, well, you know that the false Christ comes first. The false Christ appears before the true Messiah, the prince with the uppercase P at the beginning of his name. And it is that uppercase that is cut off, crucified, for our benefit. Now, listen and understand verse 27 to complete the chapter. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. This is not the true Christ. This is Antichrist. This one week is what? It's the 70th week. <clears throat> and... With many, uh, with many for one week, and in the midst of the week, that's three and a half years, seven total. He shall cause the sacrifice of, and the oblation to cease. That's the daily offering. Why? Today it's Holy Communion. And instead of taking communion to the Lord Jesus Christ, they will be taking it to the fake. So the true communion will cease for people misguided, lied to, that have not studied God's word to show themselves approved, they're going to worship him, thinking he is the true Christ. <clears throat> and, for the, and for the overspreading of abominations on the wings of abomination, he shall make it desolate, it will make the desolator. This is an entity, not a condition in the Hebrew manuscripts. Even until the consummation, that is to say the very end, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate or the desolator. In other words, God's going to pour it on him. He's going into the abyss. <clears throat> now, here we have this, seven, this 70th week. Now, th there is a gap, 69 to the crucifixion, and then the gap of the seventh until the very end of times, the latter days. That's what it's about. And, and at that time that the false one comes and is destroyed, Christ picked it up and made it very clear in, in the great book of Mark. This is, this is the thing you want to be careful of. And it's best you check this out in the Hebrew. You with companion Bibles, you're very fortunate. Your side column on this 27th verse kind of separates desolate from desolator because rather than a condition, we're talking about an entity, that prince with the lower case. We're talking about the Antichrist. And it's important that you know and understand. Did Jesus teach such a thing? Well, of course he did. And he verified the book of Daniel, when, even when he walked the earth. I'm going to take you to Mark chapter 13. I want you to pick it up in the 14th verse. This is where Christ said, be careful that no one deceives you, for many are going to come in my name. In other words, claiming to be Christian preachers. He said, I didn't send them. So you want to be real careful. They will deceive you. See that you're not deceived. Stick to the word of God, in other words. They're going to deliver you up before the synagogue of Satan and allow the Holy Spirit to speak through you. But how does he cinch this? Well, listen, verse 14. But when you shall see the abominations of desolation, that's to say the desolator, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, we just read it in the 27th verse of 9th chapter, standing where it ought not, 
Let me give you a little Greek lesson here. The word meaning her, him, it, or, um, is all the same word in the Greek. The subject matter that you're addressing determines the value of it as to whether it means him, he, or she, or it. Okay. So if we're talking about desolator instead of desolation, a condition, but an entity, desolator, it should be he. Dr. Moffat translated this word it, he, and so it should be. Standing where he ought not, let him that readeth understand, you that are wise. Then let them that be in the Judea flee to the mountains. Why? That's where he's going to appear, the false one. <clears throat> That's where Daniel says he's going to appear. Verse 15, And let him that is on the housetop not go into the house, neither enter there in to take anything out of his home. You're, you're, in other words, the end is there. You're not going to need to change your clothes. This is it. And let him that is in the field not turn back again for to take up his garment. You're not going to need to change your clothes again. 17, but woe to them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. Meaning what? Meaning woe to those. You're supposed to be a virgin spiritually when the true Christ returns. But if you have fallen for this fake prince and you've intend, uh, attended a wedding with him, and have been spiritually impregnated, what Christ wants you to do is feel his emotions. He expects a virgin bride. He doesn't want somebody to be, he doesn't want someone for a, at his wedding that's been wallowing around with Satan. They're not, it's not going to happen. <clears throat> Therefore, he puts it in a language that if your husband has been away for 2,000 years, and he returns and you're suckling a small child, what does that mean? You were unfaithful. That's what he's talking about. There's no sin in a mother bearing a child in her womb. That's a natural thing and it's very good. But don't be spiritually impregnated with lies from Satan. And especially don't be nursing along his work. That means bringing your kin folks right into the false, the false teaching. And, uh, but, and so it is. And 18, and pray that ye that your flight be not in the winter. When is harvest? This is the harvest time. You don't harvest in winter. What he's saying, the meaning is, don't be harvested out of season. Wait for the true Messiah. Verse 19, for in those days shall be affliction such as was not from the beginning of the creation which God created unto this time, neither shall be. And, and so this, this is a rough time. You know, you've got a, some of these higher critics who say, well, that happened in 70 A.D. That's malarkey. Little tin-horned Roman general named Titus didn't bring to pass the greatest turmoil there shall be from the beginning of time until the end. But the Antichrist shall. 20, and except that the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh should be saved, but for the elect's sake. That's God's elect. Whom he hath chosen, he hath shortened the days. Now, this is why we came here. To show you that Christ shortened the time from seven years to five months. You found out that five months in the great book of Revelation in chapter 9 where Christ warns you that the false Christ would be here for a five-month period, which is the time of the locust from May through September. Verse 21, And then if any man shall say to you, Lo, here is Christ, or Lo, he is there, believe him not. He's lying to you. When the false Christ appears, most of the world is going to think Christ has returned. But you know better. Don't let them deceive you. This is why Christ shortened the time. They're, it's pretty swift and it's going to be pretty rough. Why? Verse 22, For false Christ and false prophet shall rise. Did it say maybe? No. Shall rise. Are you going to believe them? You better get set. It's all, they're already plowing pretty deep in the minds of a lot of people. And shall show signs and wonders to seduce if it were possible, even the elect. That's how good Satan is in deception as the false messiah. 
You want to be geared for it. You want to have the Holy Spirit in you and you and he, him, whereby you have the knowledge in your mind of exactly how it's going. That's why Jesus is telling you here exactly how it's going down. The message was delivered by Gabriel himself and Jesus Christ as he walked the earth. Now, man will deceive you. Gabriel and Christ will not. They're giving you the straight scoop. That's how it's going to be. So if somebody, while you're still in a flesh body, number one, count, count the events that transpire. At the seventh trump, we're all changed into spiritual bodies, and that's when Christ returns. Satan, as you know from Revelation, comes at the sixth trump. So, therefore, you're still in a flesh body. So, if you're still in a flesh body and somebody says Christ is here or Christ is there, they're lying to you. I mean, that's simple enough a child can understand it. And that's why in the simplicity of Christ's teachings, if you'll stop, think, use common sense, you'll never be deceived. What did, what did Christ do for us that he shortened the time? And what else did he do? Verse 23 but take ye heed, behold, I have foretold you all things. How many things did he tell us? All things. Have you read it? Have you absorbed it? Or are you wanting? Then it's never too late. Get into his word, rightly divide it, show yourself approved. Well, what did he tell us after that? 24. But in those days, after the, that tribulation, after that, tri that's, the tri that's the first tribulation. There's two of them. That's Antichrist tribulation. The sun, of, the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. What happens then? 25. And the stars of heaven shall fall and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. Great shaking. 26. And then, and then only, I'll say. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And you're not going to see him until that point, the true Christ. Not until after the false Christ has come to this earth to say, I've come to rapture you out of here. A lot of people are going to jump on his wagon. As a matter of fact, as we read in the great book of Revelation, all the world whores after the Antichrist if they haven't read God's Word, if they do not have the seal of God in their forehead, which simply means the truth from God's Word in their mind where they can't be had. They have the power that God give us over all of our enemies. They're not afraid to use it. And certainly, um, so there you have, I, I'm going to give you another example of many people. This is called the gap theory between the 69 weeks and the 70th week. But you see, Christ taught this when he entered the synagogue and picked up the book of Isaiah. And in the book of Isaiah, he read, now and this is the time of salvation. He stopped reading in the middle of the sentence, concluding the day of salvation, because the very next word is the day of vengeance. So there is a gap between. Christ wanted you to know that. Meaning what? Before he was cut off, he came as Savior. He came a babe, born a babe, was crucified, but he, he paid the price and brought salvation. He's coming back now as King of kings and Lord of lords and to rule with a rod of iron, not to be crucified, but to rule this time and to bring the earth back into the fullness of that was promised back in verse 24 that, uh, of this same chapter 9. So how complete it is and how wonderful the, the Word of God. When you take the correct chronological order of time that this book of Daniel was written in by the dating of the kings and the 110-year correction from king to king to absolute, it gives you basically the absolute date of Christ's birth and his crucifixion, whereby you know the cutting off. And then we know by that same Lord Jesus Christ, behold, I have foretold you all things. He told, there's not going to be three and a half years. There's going to be five months. Otherwise, Satan would have everybody deceived. 
he's certainly not going to deceive his elect. So there you have it. But one of the most beautiful, meaningful chapters in the Word of God. Chapter 10, verse 1, as we continue. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that's Iran of today, a thing was revealed unto Daniel, whose name was called Belteshazzar, and the thing was true. But the time appointed was long, and he understood the thing and had understanding of the vision. It has to do with today. Okay. Cyrus is one of the only uh, few people that God himself named. God named the Lord Jesus Christ. You will call him Emmanuel, which is to say God with us. But Cyrus wasn't even an Israelite. Cyrus was a heathen. Uh, uh, and God named him. He said, I'm, I'm going to use him. He's going to free my children, the tribe of Judah. And so here Daniel is, and it is a, a thing that is true. You can count on it. Verse 2, in those days I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. That's 21 days. Three, I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth, <clears throat> excuse me, neither did I anoint myself at all, till three whole weeks were fulfilled. He, he prayed uh, right on through, there, right up from that mountaintop, 21 days. Three full weeks, four. And in the four and twentieth day of the first month, as I was by the side of the great river, which is Hedekal. Now, uh, and Hedekal, where, where, where is Hedekal? Well, let's keep up with this because it's prophecy concerning now. Hedekal is the Tigris River. It's even mentioned in, way back in the book of Genesis in the beginning. <clears throat> It is the river that runs between Iraq and Iran today. And much of the trouble that is given there, you're going to learn considerably uh, to the fullness in the remaining chapters of this great book. But understand where you are. You're right there between Iran and Iraq when this vision was shown. Then, and it was to happen in many, many years down the road, like right now. Five, then I lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose loins were girded with fine gold of euphaz. That's the best there is. Six, his body also was like the burl, and his face as the appearance of lightning, and his eyes as lamps of fire and his arms and his feet like in color to po polished brass, and the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude. We, we know the angel of the Lord, and we know who's going to be here. It's going to be Gabriel and Michael also. It's going to be traveling in some pretty high uh, company here, so you want to listen to them. Seven, and I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. For the men that were with me saw not the vision, but a great quaking fell upon them so that they fled to hide themselves. It is an awesome thing to be spoken to by Almighty God. It is not a light thing. You hear many would-be uh, men of God will say, I'll talk to God today, well, simply when they pray to God. When God talks to you and you talk to Him direct, it is, it is not a, it is an awesome, awesome thing. It's probably something you're not even going to talk about, okay, because it has a meaning that uh, something must be carried out usually. Eight, therefore I was left alone and saw this great vision, and there remained no strength in me for my comeliness, uh, his vigor, his vitality, was turned in me into corruption, and I retained no strength. I was about to faint. I was about to pass out. Verse 9, Yet heard I the voice of his words. And when I heard the voice of his words, then was I in a deep sleep on my face, and my face toward the ground. Awesome. Verse 10, And behold, an hand touched me. 
which he set me upon my knees and upon the palms of my hands. God doesn't want you to fall out in front of him. He wants you to stand up and act like a man of God or a woman of God. That's why he would say to Job in Job chapter 38, get up from there, gird yourself, and stand up like a man. Verse 11, and he said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved. Oh, how father loved him. You know, Daniel was given so much wisdom by God that even in the 28th chapter of Ezekiel where it speaks of the greatness of Tyrus, that's Satan, the cherub that covereth, he said, you're wiser than Daniel. That's how wise Daniel was and how beloved of Almighty God. Understand the words that I speak unto thee and stand upright. Get from there. For unto thee am I now sent. And when he had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. This is why you always stand in the presence of God. I mean, he is your father and he loves you or his messenger. 12. Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. Daniel was praying to understand for the benefit of his people, not himself. That'll, that'll get you a lot of attention from Almighty God when you show compassion upon God's children and are willing to serve. So God heard him at the beginning of the three weeks, at the beginning of the 21 days. Verse 13, but the prince of the king of Persia, now you'll notice this prince is in lowercase also. And... Um, is of Persia withstood me and one in 20 days, withstood me one in 20 days, but lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me and I remained there with the kings of, of uh, Persia. Now, naturally, um, Michael, we're talking here supernatural. We're talking about a conflict in heaven. We're not talking about an earthly king in Iran. We're talking about the overlord of Iran is having trouble with Michael and Gabriel and God himself. If you were to take the common denominator, which you will learn before this book is finished, and, you would, and to convert the three weeks to our years, it would be about 31 years of trouble from the Tigris forward. 14. Now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days. For yet the vision is for many days. It's not happening real soon. It's for that final week. It's going to be the end times. So you want to know what happens in the end times? God's telling you. This is why Jesus could say in Mark 13, hey, I have foretold you all things. So there's no excuse for not knowing. 15, and when he had spoken such words unto me, I set my face toward the ground and I became dumb. It, it kind of took my breath away. Verse 16, and behold, one like the similitude of the sons of men touched my lips. And then I opened my mouth and spake and said unto him that stood before me, O my Lord, by the vision my sorrows are turned upon uh, me, for I have retained no strength. The, the presence is awesome. And so it is. 17, for how can the servant of this my Lord talk with this my Lord? Question. For as for me, straightway there remaineth no strength in me, neither is there uh, breath left in me. Uh, the very presence just really took, every, took the wind right out of his sails. 18. 
Then there came again and touched me one like the appearance of a man, and he strengthened me. Hazak in the Hebrew tongue, touch, touched him. And that strength flowed. He drew from that one. It would have been either Gabriel or Michael, one or the other. 19, and said, O man greatly beloved, fear not, peace be unto thee. Be strong, yea, be strong. And when he had spoken unto me, I was strengthened and said, let my Lord speak, for thou hast strengthened me. And there, all strength and power comes from Almighty God when it has to do with dealing with the supernatural. Verse 20, then said he, Knowest thou wherefore I came unto thee? And now will I return to fight with the prince of Persia. And when I am gone forth, lo, the prince of Grecia shall come. We, we've got some, you've got some pretty bad people. It's, that's Javon in the Hebrew. Prince of Javon. That um, uh, all kinds of conflict in the end times takes place in heaven. That's why there will be both a great shaking in heaven and on earth, as it's written in Hebrews chapter 12, in the final summation or consummation of this earth age. And, and so it is that our Father, in the love for his children, expects you to absorb and to understand the word. He's going to be gentle about it. But no one understand that uh, when you fight the good fight of the end times, don't worry, there's fighters in heaven also. One more verse to complete the chapter. But I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth, and there is none that holdeth with me in these things but Michael, your prince, the very prince of Israel itself. He's going to tell him. And, and so it is. We'll pick it up in the next lecture. Be sure and don't miss it. Information from Almighty God concerning the last years. Listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. And there we are. Back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, hey, all over Canada. If the spirit moves and you have a question, you share it. Won't you do that? Please never ask a question about a particular reverend or denomination or organization. We do not judge people. Our Father is the judge, and he does not need our help. As I stated earlier, you have the right to discern who you should fellowship with, who you should listen to. That is your prerogative and your right. But do not judge other people. Leave that in God's hands. Boy, can he take care of business. Those of you that listen by short wave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you. And your announcer at the end of the hour will give you a mailing address. Uh, again, always a pleasure. Now, got a prayer request? You don't need that number and you don't need an address. Why? God knows what you're thinking right now. You don't even have to say it out loud. He is the cardio knower, it states in the Greek, meaning he knows your heart. He even knows what you're thinking. That's why no one can ever prevent you from praying, because you don't have to pray out loud, and no one even knows when you're praying, except our Father. And he always hears, just like as, as today, 
we learned he heard David, da Daniel, rather, the very first day of the 21 days, he heard the prayer. And he loves it when you talk to him from the heart. So um, let's go to his throne at this time. Father, around the world, we come, we ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father, touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, and question time. D from Virginia. Paul in the scripture said that he suffered not a woman to teach nor use of authority over man. Does this mean a woman cannot preach? It states in the Greek, a woman shall not chatter. And that, you know, it takes a pretty good Greek scholar to pick up on that because the, the change is so minor, but it's the manuscripts ver verify. It is, it is also written that in Acts chapter 2 that in the end times when people are delivered up before the false Christ, both my sons and my daughters shall prophesy. Okay. Even in the Old Testament, it, it gives an account if you would, in the book of Joel, chapter 2, both my sons, daughters, my handmaids, old men, they're going to prophesy, they're going to teach. Okay, so women are included. And, and you cannot d discount history. There was a time when we were in the time of the judges where we didn't have kings, we just had judges. No man would stand up. Country was in bad shape. But along comes a woman named Deborah. And what? a judge she was and she led Israel even on the battlefield and had the victory because God let man know I can use a woman for whatever I choose when that time comes to pass okay so be careful uh, if God chooses a woman to teach I would not want to get in her way uh, also in Corinthians he speaks of a woman's hair as her covering does that mean she can't cut her hair. You know, a little, I guess God winks at, winks at ignorance, but you're talking about 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 10. What's the subject there? The subject, Paul says, a woman should keep her covering. I know it's translated hair, but it means you better keep Christ as our covering. A woman had better keep Christ over her head. Verse 10 reads what? Because of the angels. Why? The fallen angels are coming again. They're not so much after men. They're after women. Okay. They like to seduce women, just to put it straight on. This is why Jesus would teach in Matthew chapter 24, which is the equivalent of the Mark 13 we were reading today about the last hours. Jesus said, in the end days, the last hours, it's going to be just like it was in the days of Noah. The fallen angels are going to be giving and taking in marriage again. So that's what it's talking about. It has nothing to do with a woman's hair, but the fact that she'd better have Christ over her head. Why? Because he gives us power over the fallen angels, Satan, and all of our enemies. Luke chapter 10, verse 18, 19. Dolly from Georgia if you ask God to forgive you of your sins, are they gone? How do you know? Dolly, you want to be real careful. You see, in the way you ask your question, I can tell you're a doubter. Uh, you have to love God enough. He's your father. And he promised you that if you repent and you mean it from your heart, he forgives you. That's enough to know. And you do not want to question that. Um, it is not a healthy thing to question God. And when he forgives you a sin on repentance, and you pick it back up again, he's going he's gonna to lower the boom on you. He's going to pull away all of his protection. Uh, document that in Scripture. Jeremiah chapter 23, the closing verses of the chapter. Don't you dare ever ask what burden is God going to put on us today? Because God doesn't put burdens on you. But if you blame God for burdens, he's, he's going to let you suffer the full consequences. It's up to you. So don't ever doubt God. When you repent, he has promised, I forgive you, it's gone. He said, 
I don't ever want to hear about it again. So don't bring it back up to him again. That's trouble. Jim from Pennsylvania. Pastor Murray, what do I do to keep the devil from taking over my life? Well, you stand up and act like a man and you fight. You get meaner than a junkyard dog with the power of the Lord Jesus Christ and order anything negative out of your life. You don't have to put up with it. You don't, God won't suffer wimps. If you want to let Satan overwalk you, hey, just have a good day because uh, God will let it if you, that's what you want. <clears throat> but you're a child of the living God. And, and as I stated earlier in Luke chapter 10, verse 19, he gives you power in the name of Christ over all of your enemies. So why would you tolerate it? You keep Christ in your life and the devil will be afraid of you. He will run from you. And that's the way you should be as a child of God, to have evil spirits absolutely flee when they see you coming because you have the power of the Lord Jesus Christ and you know how to utilize it. Okay. That's how you handle it. You be a man of God. Michelle from Tennessee. I've done some things I'm ashamed of in the past, and now I feel like I am not worthy. I love the Lord, but I worry about what I've done. Why would you worry about it when it's gone? God said, when I forgive you, I don't want to hear about it again. So why are you hanging on to it? It is true that, uh, you see, um, Michelle, where your problem is, you're not forgiving yourself. If you don't forgive yourself, God's not going to forgive you. <clears throat> I mean, you know, Paul had this same problem. Paul persecuted the church something awful. I mean, he, he, he drug people, men, women, out in the street. He even helped the coats while they murdered Stephen in Acts chapter 7. <clears throat> and Paul, that bothered Paul. He always wondered and but God used him to write most of the New Testament because he converted. So um, know when you're forgiven, it's over. That's it. That's the beauty of Christianity. So don't let it slip away from you. I'm going to say that again. The beauty of Christianity is that Christ died on the cross to forgive our sins. And when he forgives them, they're gone. It never happened. So how could you feel bad about it if it never happened? Praise God, you get in the Word and you stay there. Willie from Wisconsin. Is Jesus and Michael the same? Absolutely not. Is Michael over the mercy seat? Where can I find this in the Bible? Well, we know that Satan always wanted the mercy seat. He was one of the angels' cherubims that stood there. But Michael is Satan's tender, and you have proof of it in Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 and 8. For it is Michael and Michael's angels that cast Satan out on this earth as the false Christ. That means he has him under his power and control right now. We were reading a little bit about that conflict today, and we'll cover more of it tomorrow. So <clears throat> it is blasphemy to angel worship. You understand that? I mean, it is a very serious thing. Do not worship angels. You worship God alone. And to say that Michael is Christ when he's really Emmanuel is to say Michael was God with us. That's blasphemy. Michael is the archangel of Israel. And what a wonderful uh, archangel he is. He's an entity all to himself and deserves everything coming his way. Uh, Trish from Texas. I'm having trouble understanding something. Please help me. I know there are demons and evil spirits here on earth since Satan is being held in heaven. Exactly how does this influence? How does he influence his followers? Does Satan direct his demons and evil spirits or are they just doing what comes natural to them. They're, they're just evil. But for, you've got to remember, for every negative, there is a positive. God allows, though Christ is at the right hand of God, 
his spirit, that is to say the Holy Spirit, can traverse the earth. It can touch you. It can warm you. Well, likewise, the opposite of that is Satan's spirit and his evil fallen ones. Their spirits can also traverse the earth. They are not good. Okay? They are evil. And, um, and they are allowed to do that. But, as I've already stated two times in this lecture, Luke chapter 10, verse 19, we have power over all of our enemies, including the serpents, the dragon, the whole thing, all of our enemies. <clears throat> God gives us that. Well, why? Because he loves us. So um, there are not evil spirits behind every bush, but there are evil spirits in the world. There certainly are. John from Texas, what does the dead in Christ shall rise again mean? <clears throat> You're misquoting it a little bit. It says the dead in Christ shall rise first. Why do the dead in Christ rise first? Well, it simply means that as Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 6 and 7 so declare, instantly when the silver cord parts, means you kick the bucket and you die, your spirit, which is the intellect of your soul, your soul returns to the Father that gave it. So therefore, they are the first to return. When you die, you're the first to return. The rest of us remain. And we, there's no way we can precede, pre precede them. And you're quoting from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 17. Okay. No way we can precede them. Why? They're already gone. They're not out here in some hole in the ground. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. St. John chapter 8, last verses. Uh, Joe from Pennsylvania. When Christ was on the cross, why did he say, God, why hast thou forsaken me? And are all sins created equal? No, no they're not. Uh, the punishment for sins varies, okay, for one to the other. But God, what did God say on the cross? He said, Eli, Eli, lama shabbatene, which is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Jesus never called our Father God himself when he was personally addressing him. He always called him Father. Now, so what was he doing? He was quoting Psalms 22. He was teaching on the cross. Well, what does Psalms 22 says? Psalms 22 tells you about the crucifixion a thousand years before the fact that they would pierce him and nail him to the cross. Even that the Roman soldiers would be gambling for his clothing at the foot of the cross, written a thousand years before it was taking place right there. That's why he said it. God will never leave you. He will never forsake you. And Christ on the cross was God with us. Ruby from New Mexico. What is your opinion of the vehicle described in Ezekiel and in Revelation? I don't really understand what it is, but it sounds like an aircraft. Well, it, the color amber in the Hebrew manuscripts, as you will find in Ezekiel 1, verse 4, is highly polished bronze. It had the appearance of highly polished bronze, and it was circular. It had windows, and he could see people in the windows. And every time the vehicle turned, the people turned, naturally, because they were in it. But as best as Ezekiel, who the only wheel he'd ever seen is on an ox cart that turns beside you. He said, these didn't go on their side. They went like this, and they looked not where they went, meaning they had no head or neck. They just went wherever they wanted to. So he described it pretty good, and... They were vehicles, and God's throne was aboard it. They weren't unidentified vehicles. It was God's transportation. Gen well, did God need transportation? Of course he did. His, his, his throne, the whole smash right there. Jeanette from California. My question is, why, do, does, why, do the Antichrist, why does the Antichrist have to stop here on earth? Why doesn't he go straight to the pit from heaven? Thank you for your teaching. Well, God won't allow it. You see, he is the tester. 
is to check up on God's children as to who we're going to have in heaven with us and who's not going to be there. We do not, and God does not, want somebody that's a failure, that is to say that will not love him, in heaven for the eternity because we'd have trouble again. Well, how do we prevent having trouble in heaven forever and ever? Get rid of the bad stuff. That simple. Maybe an oversimplification, but that's exactly what it amounts to. Well, how does God get rid of the bad stuff? He releases Satan for a short season as Antichrist to see how many people have done their homework. Because Satan, when he comes, doesn't bring war. He brings love and prosperity. I've come to save you. I mean, you will never have seen such a show, such acts, such miracles performed before people to deceive them. We've been warned. They have too if they would read the word. But that's why he must come, is to cull out the bad, to find out who's done their homework and who hasn't. Thank God we have the millennium in between. For those that didn't have an opportunity to learn, we're going to teach them for a thousand years, and then comes the great white throne judgment. Don from Kentucky. Um, I have a verse I'm trying to locate. The only thing I know is that it spoke of the wicked being blessed and something about as it would be as like fat dropping into the fire. Can you please help me with this? I, I can be happy to. You're talking about Psalms 37. And Psalms 37 is an acrostic. In other words, there are three verses in that psalm that only have three standards where the others have four. I believe that's right, or vice versa. But those three verses stand out. <clears throat> and the question of the acrostic is, why does it always seem like the wicked win? And God in the acrostic says, don't even worry about that because the wicked are going to be like the fat of lambs. I think it's verse 20, dripping into the fire. And then the third verse of the acrostic at near the end of the chapter is you're going to be there to see it. So the wicked don't get away with anything. They only think they do. Many people think, well, I, 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 if I could just be rich, huh? ill-gotten gains, they're always looking over their shoulder. There's always somebody after them. You cannot have gained ill-gotten gains without having enemies of glory. You'll never have peace of mind with that kind of wealth. But if you have blessings of God and are wealthy that way, you enjoy it. God doesn't have anything against people being rich if it's rich with his blessings. Ashamed from Arizona. I'll be careful when I read this. After watching your question and answer when we did the 13th chapter of Revelation, I'm scared to death. Pastor, when I was younger, I stole from a few people. These people are now dead and I can't pay them back. For years, I do mean years, I have had more guilt than you can ever know. Well, then repent of it, okay? Now that they're gone, there's nothing you can do to repay them. But God loves you. Repent. Repent to Almighty God and He will forgive you. And, and um, you're worrying about something over nothing. Okay. <clears throat> it, it is too bad. But I'm sure those that are already gone would not want you to suffer because of some probably pretty minor thing. Or even if it was major. Repent. And it's gone. Why, why live with it and suffer? You know, uh, a lot of people, now that it seems I've had two or three questions on forgiveness, I want to say something further. A lot of people live in guilt and everything else because they think they haven't been forgiven because they still remember. It is a natural thing that God has placed in us to remember our sins, but that's so we don't commit them again does not mean they're not forgiven. Just because you can remember, that's a safeguard to know, look, I got in trouble there. Don't go there anymore. That's common sense. So many times when you have trouble, 
forgiving yourself, you're remembering those things. Don't dwell on it. They, don't, they didn't exist, but the memory you have from it is to keep you from doing it again. Hazel from Tennessee. My husband was talking with a co-worker who was also a preacher when my husband <coughs> remarked that, that I told him angels don't have wings. He said, oh, yes, they do, and sent home a, cop, a couple of verses. And, of course, he went to the cher uh, cher uh, seraphim and the cherubims, and it's vehicles they were in, not wings. And you did right. You told them, Genesis 1, 26 and 7, God said, let us create man in our image, which the word in the Greek, Hebrew is pantham, meaning the exact copy. <clears throat> well, the last time I checked, and I'm made in the same image that I was there, last time I checked, I do not have wings. And how I do love to fly, but I usually have to be in an airplane to do it, okay? So, uh, man and angels do not have wings. Cherubims and seraphims have appeared in vehicles, and they are very well described. They did not have wings, and I'm out of time. Hey, I love you all because you enjoy studying our Father's Word. Most of all, God loves you for it. You know, it's the letter he sent to you, a love letter, telling you how to find happiness in these flesh bodies, not to be deceived. And when you read his letter, it makes his day. And when you make his day, boy, is he going to make yours. We're brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, bless God. He will always bless you. One thing most important, though, you listen to me, listen good. You stay in his word every day. And his word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Because Jesus Yeshua is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you. The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13 verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan.
Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Hey, we're ready to get back into our Father's Word again. Rapture. Rapture theory. Is it just a theory or is it grounded in God's Word? That's what this lecture is 